um, and welcome to the Network Service Mesh introduction. Uh, I am, my name is Nikolai Nikolaev. I work as an open source technology lead in the Open Source Technology Center at VMware. Um, and uh, the session was announced with two, um, uh, two presenters. Uh, uh, Frederick Houts uh, didn't manage to make it, so I'm going to do it on my own. We are both maintainers at Network Service Mesh. Uh, so um, I'm going to do the introduction today on my own and see how this works. Um, okay, so uh, what we're going to discuss today um, is um, some of the thoughts that we have around networking and the cloud native networking. And we will try to discuss um, uh, and demonstrate, um, I mean, in terms of uh, how, how uh, network service match works, how we are trying to solve um, these problems that we see. Uh, network service mesh is a very, very core technology, at least the way that we, we per perceive it. So whatever we are going to give as an example here is not the only uh, application of this uh, technology and this approach. Uh, so please uh, come to me, I'll be around uh, today, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, if you have specific uh, use case that you, you are finding uh, like challenges implementing it in a cloud native way, come and talk to, to me talk to us uh, as a community. Um, we have a couple of friends here also in China. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, that's it. OK, let's see uh, what the journey uh, is. Uh, so today we're going to, as I said, share some thoughts about the cloud native networking. We're going to look at how Kubernetes uh, networking API uh, does this as, as a good example. Um, uh, we also uh, usually, if someone has seen our talks, uh, we usually do uh, this story type of um, um, stories that we, we, we discuss. Um, and we usually have our friend Sarah and her problems. Uh, today we're going to show um, another of our, our, one of our friends, which is Marsha, and her um, uh, multi cloud application problems. We are going to also show. Um, how network service mesh works at a higher level, and of course, in the end, um, a couple of links. And uh, I hope that we have time for Q and A also. So uh, this is the cloud native definition uh, as uh, defined by uh, CNCF. You probably saw it um, saw it today. Um, Dan showed it at his keynote. Um, it's pretty long. There's no point into reading the whole of it, but yeah, it's very well written. So um, please go and check it uh, if you haven't done so already. But uh, we have outlined a couple of uh, points that we think are very important for the networking um, done in a cloud native way. So uh, immutable infrastructure, I guess that everyone um, kind of aspires to that and knows that this is important. Uh, loosely cap Cup, coupled system, like uh, coupling all the components that are um, imp implementing your functionality in a cloud native way, and uh, minimal toil. I mean, uh, minimal toil is, is in, in an important thing. Um, no one really would like to do uh, more than, than, than they, they should. Uh, so let's start with uh, um, minimal toil networking. So, what that would mean. Um, Essentially, um, people don't really want to think about all the details of networking. I mean, you just want your c connection done. Uh, people would not really um, want to think about subnets, routes. I mean, you're not requesting a specific subnet. You want to consume some form of networking. And that's on the conceptual level. And, um, and that's why we, we, we would like to call these uh, network services. I mean, this is a famous uh, terminology, but uh, we would like to think that uh, all the, the requirements for connectivity, all the aspects of connectivity are packaged in a single term called network service. So all, all your security, load balancing, nothing, whatever you need, you just pack it as a, as a network service. And then when you want to consume it, you want to refer to it by name. You, you just want, OK, I want my secure internet connectivity. This is a typical example that we give in our talks and uh, one of our core examples in the project. But essentially, imagine if you want to run your application in a cloud, in a public cloud, and you want to connect to your office, you want to consume 
some of form of network service that will get you the proper secure uh, access to your uh, corporate internet. Of course, there are other examples given here, but uh, we can continue with exemplifying this. Uh, now, how, how Kubernetes is doing this, how Kubernetes networking is uh, uh, applying these concepts. Um, so essentially from conceptual point uh, of view, um, you basically get your uh, layer three connectivity out of the box. Once the uh, pot is uh, deployed and created, you get your, um, your uh, layer three connectivity. You can do security with network policies. Uh, load balancing is there for your services and uh, um, between the endpoints. Uh, and um, what one would really note if you start looking a little bit closer is that mostly most of these um, concepts are about intercluster, like um, all the, the networking that goes inside a single cluster. Um, there has been challenges about this people are trying to overcome, but if you look at the plain networking that uh, Kubernetes describes today, it's about inter-cluster inter communication and uh, connectivity. Um, if you want to consume it, as we said, it's just there. Once you get your pod uh, connected, you have everything there and uh, uh, network policies and services are really easy to consume and to implement. Uh, uh, when we talk about loose coupling, um, um, this, is, this is something that's very familiar to all the application developers uh, when we start talking about uh, microservices. It's essentially a way to abstract um, all your b building blocks through some uh, API uh, ab abstractions and then you can kind of build, build um, um, like from these small blocks, you can build more complex functionalities and um, um, design patterns. Uh, it's a very flexible way to actually implement uh, more complex functionalities, but if you look at it, uh, historically networking has been very strongly coupled to the to the, to the infrastructure. And um, uh, with what we typically see is that uh, your networking is uh, coupled to your cluster, to your data center, if you're using a public cloud, VPC, etc. And you don't really have very much granularity and flexibility to the way that uh, people would would really like to, to, to do it at some point if you start doing more advanced uh, things. Um, how this works uh, with uh, Kubernetes networking? Uh, yes, in general, you are uh, you are decoupled from the specific implementation through the CNI, which is container network interface, uh, container networking interface, uh, and um, um, on the other hand. Uh, it is also strongly coupled because you usually get one uh, CNI plugin per cluster. You can do multiple CNIs, there are ways, uh, but it's not really, I'd say, consistent and easy to do it. Um, what you uh, you would also see is that there is a single edge, which is typical for, for the entire cluster or even uh, for multiple clusters, like if you are running in the, in the data center uh, using virtual machines, then it, you can very easily uh, end up with a single edge of your m multiple clusters sharing. Um, and the granularity is not, is not very, um, very fine here. I mean, like, uh, you, you, you either get uh, uh, your networking or you don't get it. You cannot tweak for particular workloads. <clears throat> From the immutable, point, uh, immutable infrastructure point of view, um, uh, essentially your pods run on really high level, uh, so um, you cannot um, really change uh, anything particular from the point of view of the networking function that are actually, they are abstracted through the Kubernetes and uh, CNI APIs, so your pods really cannot request any specific um, uh, networking capabilities uh, from, from the infrastructure, I mean, you cannot change it that easy, so that's a check here, compromise. So uh, let's uh, look at our example and uh, the um, story that Marsha has to tell us. Uh, so um, Marsha is trying to implement an application that has uh, some multi-cloud and hybrid cloud aspects. What that means is that essentially uh, she wants uh, to, um, she has workloads that are running possibly in a public cloud 
um, uh, in a private Kubernetes deployment, uh, maybe some legacy virtual machines, and um, here we have some bare metal deployments. Like for example, there could be some huge database running here already uh, in your data center, and you don't want to mess with it. So she wants all these things connected. Now, if you look from the point of view of networking, you will find that um, each of these domains have their own ideas about how they do networking. So the public cloud have their own private uh, CNI implementations, your uh, on-premises uh, um, Kubernetes deployment, you probably have um, some, some of the publicly available uh, CNI implementations or private CNI implementations. Virtual machines have their virtual networking, and of course your bare metal physical networks. The usual way that you interconnect this uh, is on a network-to-network -network, uh, um, um, direct connections, which is not very fine-grade. Like, I mean, the, the, the usual way that we do this is uh, you just uh, draw a line, if you, if you want to call it like this, uh, from one network to the other, and then uh, you assume that both networks are connected, and then you have to put some filtering uh, and uh, additional work just to, to, to be able to isolate particular workloads and pods. And there's no actually real way for Marsha, being just a developer, to, to do this on her own. I mean, she, she has to work with all the teams that are involved in setting up all this complex networking. Uh, but uh, in the end, what she really wants to do is to, to be able to connect uh, her workloads only. So she, she wants, wants to be able to uh, declare and say, OK, my workload that runs on the pub public cloud wants to, to connect to my workload that runs on the private cloud, on the virtual machine, bare metal, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's one of the things that we are trying to solve with uh, Network Service Mesh. It's where it comes. Um, uh, we have this concept of virtual wires uh, or um, some kind of abstraction of connections that uh, actually will um, will help her in this um, situation uh, to essentially request a network service that will implement this point-to-point -point con connectivity for her. Uh, of course, under the hood, there still be you know all the all the networking uh, inter inter cloud inter cloud ne networking going on, but the network service. Um, being something that can be requested straight from the pod level actually will help her uh, very easily to implement her distributed application. Um, so that's what we said already. Essentially, we have this Marshall sub connectivity network service that she can request and she, she can do that. Um, from the minimal tor po point of view, uh, whatever we do with network service mesh, and I have an example later to explain how this works, more or less is essentially uh, what she, she has to do is to just um, uh, annotate her deployment uh, manifest uh, with this, um, with this uh, special label uh, where she ex essentially requests a specific network service, uh, and then uh, network service mesh takes over and actually provides all the connectivity from there. Of course, someone has to implement the network service before it's not working just magically out of the box. Um, from the loose coupling, yeah, we already said that. Essentially, um, you don't uh, you don't bind uh, to your um, uh, inter uh, inter domain connectivity. You bind to to like decouple from, from, from there, and uh, you, you you have just your connectivity between your workloads. And from the immutable, point, uh, immutable infrastructure point of view, essentially the way to enable network service mesh is to, we have um, uh, Helm charts, or you just install um, NSM there. It works on top of Kubernetes. It doesn't change any aspects of Kubernetes. It doesn't use any speci special version of Kubernetes. It doesn't change the CNI. It doesn't interfere with it. Uh, we think that CNI does its job um, um, great for whatever it was designed. We don't want to mess with it. I know that there are some approaches people are trying to implement some various form of tweaked CNIs, etc., to solve some of these problems. Uh, our approach is to kind of amend to that to provide uh, some extended cap capabilities based on, on, on our concept that we do with Network Service Mesh. Um, and of course, it works with any CNI. And uh, to 
prove that it works with any CNI, we are having our CI and uh, continuous deployment, our CI/CD pipeline uh, continuously running on, all, on a couple of public clouds, also uh, virtual machines, bare metals, and also we use Kind. I don't know if you're familiar with Kind, but it's a really nice project to, to, to run your tests against. It essentially runs Kubernetes in a Docker. Uh, so, um, uh, with that, uh, I, uh, I can move on to how this thing works. Uh, and before we talk about how this thing works, uh, how NSM works, uh, I would like to talk you through a little bit to our definition of what actually NSM is. So, um, uh, NSM is three things, network service definition of GRPC API and distributed control plane with minimal shared state. So, um, starting from the last, so distributed control plane, this kind of resembles the approach that Kubernetes has with its uh, kubelet. So, they are kind of local agents that are uh, semi-separated from each other. It's kind of distributed. They work on, on their own. This is what we do again. We call these network service managers. Um, we run them as um, daemon sets. Um, then uh, the uh, gRPC API is essentially an abstracted way to describe, publish, and consume network services. And then we have the definition of a network service where we actually say that a network service is not a single entity. It's essentially a composition of uh, multiple functions and uh, uh, endpoints that are kind of bound together to a single network service uh, description, descriptor. Um, of course, all these concepts and all these theories we have implemented uh, in our Git uh, repo. Uh, it's a, a Kubernetes-based implementation, but the overall architecture of the project is, uh, is done in a way that uh, we, uh, the spe Kubernetes specifics are iso isolated in a separate module that can be replaced. So today, uh, we don't use much of Kubernetes except for um, its central storage like etcd. Uh, and we use it also for scheduling our pods that actually are doing the mm, uh, network service mesh. Uh, but other than that, we are not tightly bound to Kubernetes. So uh, in theory, it should, be, it should be easy to actually add all these other aspects of you know, virtual machines, bare metals, and there are some interested in work going on in the community and discussions around these things. Um, uh, also, today we, we use uh, as a kind of basic packet passing, uh, or as we call it, forwarding component, forwarding plane. We use uh, VPP, which is um, FDIO, uh, Linux Foundation project. But there is a work going on uh, um, around implementing a pure kernel only based um, uh, implementation, uh, which will not depend on VPP. And it's not that we don't like VPP, it's just that we want to, to, to be able to demonstrate how the underlying forwarding plane is independent from NSM. We are not bound to any specific implementation. We want to have something that is bare metal, um, I don't bare metal, baseline that we can just r run uh, each and everywhere without really uh, relying on any third part com components. So, a uh, couple of slides to show how, how these things work in more details. Uh, so if you have your uh, Kubernetes cluster, with let's say here we have three, um, uh, three worker nodes, uh, the first thing that we do is uh, we apply our uh, custom resource definitions. We define uh, three essential uh, CRDs, network service manager registry, uh, network service endpoint registry, and network services registry just for the services. So once we deploy with Helm, for example, uh, well, once we deploy network service uh, mesh, NSM, uh, it essentially uh, deploys the network service managers, which are the mandatory components. We also deploy alongside it the forwarding plane, which is, in this case is VPP, but it's completely orthogonal. It can be deployed in, in other, by other means. The, what's important here is that essentially the network service managers gets registered to the central registry. So they are very well uh, defined which uh, network service manager on which worker node it runs. Then the next thing is to essentially deploy the network service, which is, um, I will show it later, I have a slide which there is a, some YAML file descriptor that tells, tells us how the network service is composed out of the endpoints. Then, then we deploy the endpoints, 
uh, which also get registered in the central registry. This is for the red service. We do the same for the blue service, blue network service. And then when the client comes and wants to consume that service on so the red client there, uh, it, it will essentially communicate to its, to its local network service manager. Uh, this local network service manager is going to consult the central registry about uh, what this service is, uh, what this network service is, what endpoints are implementing it, etc., etc. There's a selection process going on based on label matching. Um, and then both network service managers that are involved in this process are going to establish a point-to-point -point connection. And that's uh, maybe one of the crucial things that we should mention here that uh, with, uh, with network service mesh, we don't do uh, broadcast domains, bridge domains, uh, any virtual switches or things like that. It's only point-to-point -point connectivity between pods. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, this uh, network service endpoint maybe would like to also chain, as it was the, 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 the term that was used in service chaining, but we would like to call it compose here but we can c connect to, to, to the other um, uh, network service endpoint that actually implements the full network service as a whole. So in this case, uh, this network service is, uh, is composed out of two endpoints. Uh, and uh, um, as you can see here, uh, the first endpoint here essentially is getting two new interfaces um, um, at runtime um, this is one thing that uh, network service uh, mesh actually um, uses as a tool to achieve its goals. Uh, we support multiple interfaces uh, for pods and they can be requested and um, disposed. At uh, runtime you don't have to restart your services to, um, um, to do any, any fancy things. They're just out there. The moment that you request the service, uh, you just get your um, interface injected and you can start consuming it. Um, same of course goes for the blue service. The client can come and uh, um, it can consume all the service. One thing that I don't, I don't know if this is seen very clearly but here on the bottom we essentially have labels uh, on the um, service request. So once um, um, connection request goes out of the, of the pod uh, you can have labels alongside it, like you can say, I want to consume service version 2, and then it, it should be able, I mean, network service mesh should be able to get you uh, the proper service uh, labeled with uh, the, the, the proper labels. There's some label matching involved here in the picture. Um, okay. Um, how the network service consumption uh, happens? So, uh, if you have your um, your application container and you want to run it in a, a network service uh, mesh uh, uh, enabled pod, uh, essentially, uh, as we showed before, uh, all you have to do is to use uh, the, our uh, annotations um, uh, f format, and then there is a thing uh, uh, which is an NSM admission controller. It processes uh, this deployment uh, at uh, deployment time, at pod creation time. Uh, and it figures out what the service is. It essentially injects an init container uh, there, uh, and this uh, init container uh, takes care um, to actually inject the interface for you uh, and to ensure uh, smooth con connectivity and uh, con consumption of the network service. Now, this is one one way that that uh, someone can do, do things. We have more advanced ways. We have an SDK that actually you can uh, incorporate in your application straight and actively request uh, and manage your uh, services and connections that your application is using. But this is the easiest way if you just want to consume something that is out of the box. You don't even have to change your application. Uh, this is an uh, example on um, on the network service uh, manifest. So this is how we uh, essentially, this is the, the descriptor of the network service manifest. So uh, the first thing that we have, we have our custom uh, resource defined uh, of kind network service. Uh, then we have the service name, which in this case is uh, secure internet connectivity, or it would be Marshall's app connectivity. If we are talking about Marshall's application here, 
Then of course we have the um, payload type, which in this case is IP. Um, our network service mesh is pretty much payload agnostic. So um, if you have seen our site or some of our slides, you probably know that we are claiming that we can do layer two and layer three connectivity. Um, um, there's nothing really bound. There's nothing, uh, nothing bound or hard coded in the architecture and the, the design principles that we we have that, that is binding us to any particular workload. Uh, so one of the use cases are just guys that were just this, that were just before me here. They were discussing Kubeflow, uh, and um, uh, Kubeflow is essentially a way to run TensorFlow in Kubernetes way, but uh, oh, okay, not Kubernetes way uh, on, a, on on top of the Kubernetes infrastructure. But uh, they are limited to whatever the Kubernetes uh, networking is giving them to essentially use TCP to um, communicate between the, 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 the nodes. Now, that's good, but um, if someone of you knows uh, TensorFlow, there's also an uh, um, improved um, um, performance, per, per, per performance improvement based on using RDMA, which is a really fast way to, uh, to communicate between the, the, the nodes. And um, one of the things that we are discussing uh, with some of the members of the community is uh, how we can essentially enable Kubeflow, for example, to talk RDMA in between the, the, the nodes. So essentially in that case, the service there would be payload, would be RDMA or I don't know, something else, uh, whatever is needed there. Um, so to continue here with the um, uh, that was always mesh, uh, the, the descriptor. Um, we have label matching for selecting the endpoints. This is essentially a match on the uh, label that comes from the um, client re request. So, uh, in this case, uh, the label match the, the, the label match refers to API calls firewall, but it could be they, they could be multiple labels, they could be versions, etc. Whatever people people need. Uh, and then uh, we have a simple routing. Uh, and then uh, there's again label matching for selecting the endpoint. Essentially, uh, each of the endpoints are labeling themselves, saying, okay, I am implementing version one, I'm implementing a firewall, I'm implementing a gateway. Um, so uh, given all this, this is essentially the basic rule for finding the way through the mesh and uh, finding the way how to wire and to con connect things within the network service mesh. Uh, and the last thing that we have here on the slide is a wildcard. So essentially, if you don't specify any labels, you can just use a wildcard matching uh, for uh, default connectivity routing. Uh, this is more or less what I had to share with you. So uh, we have our network, uh, our site, networkservicemesh.io. Uh, we have our GitHub page. Uh, we are a CNCF Sandbox project since April. Um, we are actively participating with some of the initiatives there. One of them is um, uh, re related to telcos. This is another one of the aspects of network service mesh. There's some interest around this, how uh, telcos can be ena enabled uh, to do cloud native networking. Um, if you want to connect with us on our site, we have the community sub page, we have a Slack channel in the CNCF Slack. Uh, we have uh, a couple of calls uh, during the week. Uh, we have a uh, um, mailing list, it's all listed there. Uh, and uh, I think that we have some time for, for questions. Yeah, we, we do have. Uh, but if you want to find me later, um, uh, unfortunately, as I said, um, the other maintainer that was supposed to be here couldn't make it, so I'm the only one representative here from the project. I'll be later at uh, our booth uh, between 2 and 4 p.m. today and tomorrow at the CNCF answer bar uh, near, near the end of the, the, the event, but I'll be there if someone wants to chat and discuss about their specific problems, I'll be there. And uh, that's all from me. Uh, guess that we have some time for questions, maybe. Yeah, we do. For oh, questions. Hi, Nicola. Uh, great proposal. Yeah. I have um, uh, three questions, yeah. 
The first one is um, in the uh, security network service case, and uh, as uh, as you propose, yeah, an an S client to connect and um, maybe client to um the V five world service endpoint, and the service endpoint will connect to VP and gateway endpoint, mm -hmm. and can we and connect to network service to the uh, middle. Uh, service endpoint, for yep. example, for uh, V5 uh, service endpoint, yep. uh, can we connect to network service or more service? Network yes. service? Yes, yes. So uh, there's nothing uh, in the architecture that actually prevents you from doing that. Uh, it's up to the endpoint to be able to accommodate more incoming connections and how it will handle them. Now, it, it really de depends on the, the application. So. Um, if you want to have the best uh, scaling application, you can probably put some limits on the incoming connections and say, oh, okay, I cannot accept more than five connections for my uh, CNA for my, for my uh, endpoint, uh, or you can just uh, let it run as, as much as possible <laughs> to accept uh, each and every uh, request. There's, there's nothing binding in the architecture here to tell you you should run only one interface or five or 10 or there. Okay, I see. Um, but I think um, it's okay for a uh, technology. But I, 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 I guess um, it's hard to um, uh, manage the 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 second and um, uh, network service endpoint. For example, um, the network service point is the is is that and um, and we have to excuse and um, maybe two network service or more yeah. network service. I think it's it's hard for. And network connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we have that's probably one of the things that that is worth mentioning on these intro talks is that we have a pretty pretty complex uh, auto healing functionality implemented. There's some still rough edges that needs to be to be cleaned, but it works pretty well. So essentially, uh, what we have today is that uh, uh, at uh, any point in time, well, because we are essentially managing the c connections and we know what type of fu functions this endpoint is, imp is imp implementing. If the endpoint dies, we can essentially rewire you to another endpoint that uh, that implements the same function. And um, I mean, of course, um, if you if the endpoint is stateful, then it's up to you to have uh, I mean to, to the implementation of network service uh, on the, the endpoint to have the replication of the state between the neighboring endpoints. But uh, if it's stateless, then like if it's just a I don't know passive packet filter that just drops packets. For some ACL rules, uh, you can just be rewired, and your service will just continue to, to work uh, without really. Okay, there's going to be some small glitch while we identify the endpoint and why we re rewire, but still, it will continue to, to work. Okay, okay. Um, uh, uh, another question, yes. Um, uh, why we used an um, init container for um, mm -hmm. network service client to connect network service? And can we use another um, another function? For example, we use a controller. Yes, we we we, we just uh, um, and watch the um, labels of the um, the uh, init uh, in network service client label. Yeah, I I, mm -hmm. I I guess yeah. She want to uh, connect to network service, and I just um to connect to um a network service. By yeah. him and um, for yeah, the controller, yeah, yeah, but yeah, not yeah, yeah. by any container. Mm -hmm. uh, why we use that? Uh, what's the advantage and disadvantage um, of that? I guess that, that this was more or less inspired by the way that um, other guys are doing, um, like our projects in the domain are doing uh, similar things. Like, for example, I'm sure you know how the, the service meshes like Istio and Linkerd they're using not in a container but sidecar proxies sitting there. Uh, what you're saying actually makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I would be, I would be. I mean, I, it would be nice if we can chat l l later about it. But yes, it makes sense. Whatever you're, you're asking, uh, the way that we did it is we essentially have an SDK. So what we what we did is we just uh, uh, created a client, packaged it as a sidecar con container, uh, and uh, found that, that that this this works really well with an admission control, but. Yes, of course we can. We can go without it. We should be able to go without it. Uh, Inista is um, high um, 
uh, high speed um, for the nervous oh. client to connect no server service for the in container but the in in container um okay we are we are in timeout i didn't i didn't really get the question but we can chat okay later, we but, can uh, yeah. talk thank you thank you